Welcome to our next session, Intelligent Healthcare Solutions, Innovations in Products and Delivery of Healthcare Services During COVID-19. I'm Matthew Rowan, the Director of Operations for the Intelligent Community Forum. In today's session, we'll be speaking with a rural healthcare expert about her critical access hospital networks experience throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as touching base with a project manager of ICF Taiwan to learn about some of the Taiwan healthcare innovations that are out there. Now, if you're interested in healthcare, as well as the experiences of community leaders, healthcare professionals, educators, futurists, and more throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, you might want to explore our No Place But Home video series released throughout the past year. You can find these interviews at intelligentcommunity.org backslash COVID-19. Joining me now is Pat Shu, the Executive Director of the Illinois Critical Access Hospital Network, the first statewide critical access hospital network. The network was established in 2003 and is comprised of 53 critical access hospitals, providing support services and educational programs, as well as managing the Medicare Rural Hospital Flexibility Grant, Small Hospital Improvement Program, and several other grant programs on behalf of the Illinois Department of Public Health. As executive director, Pat has had overall accountability and responsibility for the organization and its subsidiaries and reports directly to the ICAHN Board of Directors. She's also responsible for the Accountable Care Organization, Illinois Rural Community Care Organization, and she represents the organization and its members serving as chief officer. Prior to this, she was the state critical access hospital program coordinator since the inception in 1999 and is instrumental in Illinois being recognized as one of the most successful state critical access hospital programs. She has more than 35 years of clinical and rural hospital administrative experience, and today she joins us. Pat, welcome. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak about all our COVID uh, experiences the past several months, and really, I guess, almost 18 months now. So uh, look forward to speaking with everybody today. Yeah, as I've been looking back on this, it's, it, it is now that I keep saying seeing that figure 18 months, it always feels like a surprise because it's been that long, but it really has. Um, so, you know, I, I do want to get into some of the innovations and all of that that you might have learned during COVID, but I, I have to ask you first, how are things going? What is the current situation within the network with patients, vaccinations, what's going on? Okay. Well, that's a fair question and a, and a big question at this point. But, uh, you know, uh, like other uh, hospitals across the country, our Illinois hospitals and small critical access hospitals, uh, we fared through it fairly well. We had our points of pressure uh, last fall when, you know, we were maxed out and everybody surrounding us were maxed out. And we were most concerned because uh, small hospitals have limited resources, limited staff and, and uh, equipment and things like that, and couldn't even transfer patients to other facilities because they were full or we couldn't get people to transfer and, um, you know, staffing was at a premium. So uh, we weathered this storm. And then as, as we progressed through 2021, the vaccine became available. And, you know, we're seeing now uh, in Illinois lowering of the, um, you know, positivity rate and, and people being you know, a good portion of our, our people in Illinois vaccinated, just like across the country, we're seeing, you know, that area. And rural hospitals and communities were a little slow to respond to the vaccine. You know, we just couldn't get it fast enough, you know, when it came out because it came out to the larger areas first. And then now it's to our rural facilities and it's pretty readily available. I can walk across the street to Walmart and, and get a vaccination today if I needed to. But for the most part, um, we, we've done that. The hospitals report to me, uh, the small hospitals, rural hospitals, that um, they're back to probably on a scale of one to 10, nine, 9.5 of their business pre-COVID. You know, um, they really have pretty well bounced back. You know, there are a couple of areas that they're still down a little bit. The emergency department, uh, we're about 10, 15 percent down from uh, pre-COVID. And that probably relates to people have found other ways of getting health care, you know, in emergency, non-emergency situation. I'm talking about, um, you know, not necessary visits. You know, you could wait until tomorrow and they use virtual telemedicine to do that. Or, you know, like I said, they've gone to more convenient care places instead of the emergency department. So rural people have started using the, the emergency department a little more efficiently. The other areas is um, 
um, back to uh, gaps in care, you know, where they have prevention screenings. They're pretty well back to normal, but they're still a little down in some areas. Surprisingly, some hospitals have told me that their business is even better you know, because they're using telemedicine and people are staying locally or they've added a new provider. People want to stay locally and so forth. Staffing levels have uh, pretty well maintained um, their course. You know, we haven't had nearly the push that we did last fall when, you know, we couldn't find any, any RNs or respiratory therapists. And, you know, at one point, staffing agencies were charging $150 to $175 an hour for an RN, you know, just, and, you know, you have to think twice about that, but, you know, patient care, you know, obviously comes first. But anyway, I think the staffing levels have, have really maintained themselves. And, um, you know, the, the big question is, is getting uh, support staff, dietary workers and, and housekeepers and people working in the business office, non-clinical people, be, uh, because of other areas across the country and businesses are needing, you know, people back to work. As far as vaccination rates for um, hospital staffs, I would say we're around 60% for rural, you know, something like that. Some hospitals, rural hospitals are like at 85, 90% and others at 40%. There's still some communities are a little reluctance. There's one hospital that their position just really is all over it. He's not excited about, you know, the vaccination, you know, doesn't, you know, not totally convinced about it. So that has a negative impact on staff. While I have other critical access, the physicians are really back behind it. You know, they've done YouTube videos and they're really promoting it. And so you see vaccination rates around 85 to 90 percent. I think as it moves along and people see that, you know, yes, if I want to be out in public or whatever, but um, they'll get the vaccination, you know, and, and um, we've had some people have had some effects from it. But um, for the most part, people have 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 done fairly well getting the vaccination. I'd be out for a little bit. Uh, I don't think any of our hospitals are giving days off if you get the vaccination, you know, um, in, in uh, recovery. But uh you know, clearly uh, it, it's, still, it's made a difference with uh, positivity rates going down and, and uh, patients aren't quite as sick. I mean, we still have a few patients uh, in talking with some of the hospitals, so a few patients that are coming in with COVID, but they're not as dramatically ill as they were uh, this past fall. You know, even, you know, with the new variant, we're, we're not seeing the um, impact as, as we had, but they're still, you know, coming in, uh, there's still some recovery, you know, people that were quite sick with COVID, you know, we have them in our, our skilled nursing units in our hospitals, and they're, you know, slow to recovery with rehab and, and so forth. Well, um, for the record, I, I, you know, when I got my second dose of the vaccine, I got it, did right, knock me out. it knocked me down for a day. It took me out. It, you know, it 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 uh it was not a pleasant day, but you know we got past it. Um, and thankfully I was lucky enough that I did get a day off for that. Um, oh, <laughs> luckily enough, luckily enough. Uh, and you mentioned telemedicine. I, I want to get back to that in, in just a second. But you spoke a lot about small hospitals and the stresses that they felt in terms of running out of space for patients or the inability to transfer patients. Now, when you say a small hospital. What size do you mean by small? Because that yeah. obviously could mean a lot of things. If you look at critical access hospital, there's 25 beds or less. There are a few critical access that have built new buildings and have only uh, built 17 inpatient beds. And so when you have that now, granted, with the public health emergency, which still is in effect, you know, you can expand bed capacity as you need to. That's not been a problem, but you still have to have staff. You've got to have physicians to take care of them and and the uh, supplies and and the testing and things like that. And what's um, what's good is that early on, we didn't have available testing. The hospitals didn't have the um, COVID testing, the PCR uh, equipment and now they have that available and, and you know, but um, so, you know, we can pretty well take care of patients uh, locally. We don't have to send things out. Uh, we've been able to get the antibodies. We've been able to do the treatments. And so um, it moved along fairly well. And, and um, as far as the, the ventilators, um, you know, we, st- we obviously have them available and staff are trained. We did some real uh, fast training, you know, last fall when uh, we couldn't transfer patients, mm-hmm. but now we're able to do that. And if they need to go to to uh, more advanced care, we can get them there and uh, so forth. And so it's pretty well back to normal. The hospitals are keeping our smaller 
rural hospitals are keeping a few more of their patients because their uh, skill sets have uh, expanded a little bit and, and we're using telemedicine. You know, maybe we can keep that patient locally instead of having to transfer them 45, 50 miles. And so it's a little, it's a plus there if you look at moving forward. Sure. Um, let's go back to kind of the start of the pandemic when all this really started to build up. And I guess for you, that would be the fall is when that really kind of hit its apex. Right. I, I think probably the August, September is when, you know, rural actually overtook urban areas, you know, the percentage sure. of, of people affected and, and, uh, it because there was really the virus had just come to the the rural areas there was no place else for it to go and and you know obviously we weren't vaccinated and you know for the most part people were social distanced but it really the impact hit very very hard um you know hospitals had really set up you know their covid units and so they were set up it was just the stress you know you know there were times hospitals had to call 18 20 uh, referral centers to transfer a patient, even if somebody experienced an acute heart attack, you know, acute myocardial infarction. Uh, and that was that was really uh, scary. And the, not that the hospitals can't treat them, but they know that maybe interventional cardiology was better, that they could have, you know, this, a stent put in and instead having to wait. And so that was a little concerning, you know, you're trying to get people to the right level of mm -hmm. care. And just because smaller hospitals don't have cardiology, you know, you want to make sure you take care of it. But these were non-COVID patients. And so, right. um, you know, we had to make those adjustments. It could be stroke or sustained injuries, you know, a variety of things like that. Now, was there, was there an advantage for rural communities because maybe they already had some systems in place because they're used to their citizens maybe being in situations where the nearest doctor is an hour or further away? Were there benefits to things like telemedicine, remote care that kind of helped uh, people still get health care during the pandemic? Um, yes, yes and no. Okay. Uh, yes, that, uh, you know, hospitals were able to make that transition to telemedicine and we had some in place, but we hadn't used it effectively. You know, we had, we hadn't, um, I'm talking about globally rural hospitals sure. and uh, rural providers, uh, clinics and things like that. We, we've had telemedicine or telehealth services available, but just not have used them as effectively. And so, um, you know, we could ramp up, but we had to get we had to incorporate in our day to day routine, you know, in a in a, a clinic area. You know, they had to have set up special rooms because you had to social distance and, you know, you had to call people had a time and train them in a rural community. Some some people don't have Internet service or it's real spotty. And so that presented problems for them. And so, um, yes, it, we were able to ramp up and we had that stuff there, but no, there's still, you know, is a challenge and, and you have to do those adjustments. We have learned some positives from it because the fact that, you know, reduced no-show rates and, um, you know, if the person uh, sees a specialist 40 or 50 miles away for just a routine visit, people are uh, that specialists are a little more accommodating, say, you know, maybe we can do this telehealth, you know, we can do this by a virtual visit instead of having to drive down for a five minute mm -hmm. exam. You know, we're learning how to do more of that. And that really helps our smaller areas in our relationship with our specialist, you know, because then they don't have as much drive time and then uh, we're still able to come. There are times, you know, obviously a patient needs to see, be seen by a specialist and that's not an issue. It's those routine follow-ups and, and that could be handled with remote. You can send blood pressures and weights and medication checks. You know, we're, we're getting quite adept at that. Um, in that. So uh, I, I think our rural community is no different. We're just a little slow, slow to the table there, but uh, once we got there, we, we've done okay you know we're, we're doing that other than other outside situations where they don't have as much strong internet you know we have to rely on you know redundancy because if your internet goes down you've got to have another form of internet service and, and that may not always be available in rural communities sure sure that's um certainly one of the challenges that that rural communities have faced throughout all of this too um you know beyond just health is, is limitations on connectivity uh and and what that means in terms of not being able to participate when you're stuck home all the time. That's right. Right. And then, you know, there are a lot of concerns of people, you know, 
you know, probably no different than our urban areas or community areas is that, you know, long term care, you know, is a, a problem in our rural communities, you know, you want to be able to go there and you can't and, and so we had to make provisions of learning how to do FaceTime, you know, it's amazing how quickly we all learned how to do FaceTime. So it was the same kind of practice with virtual visits, you know, we really needed them. And so we, we learned how to do that quickly. Well, sure. And even Zoom calls. I mean, this has been around for, for years now, but I can tell you that I've been on more Zoom calls probably this week than I've been on in my life before uh, everything right. started with right. COVID. So, so, you know, I think it's no different. As part. Then the question is moving forward is, is incorporating in our day-to-day routine, you know, um, will we have to, you know, like I'm talking about, you know, primary care or in the hospital, how will we deal with it, you know, long-term, you know, uh, will we have more ICU, EICU um, units or, you know, uh, telemedicine, will that continue to be used? Will we use hospitalists by telemedicine, you know, instead of having them on site because we're getting better at it. You know, our diagnostics, our, our, our tools are, are better. That's still, that uh, question is not fully answered yet because we're still through that delivery process there. And, you know, we saw a big drop off in virtual visits, you know, this spring because, you know, people started, you know, they opened up the, many of the states opened up and people could, go back to their primary care or hospitals for their routine and, and prevention measures. And so we saw less virtual visits and things like that. So um, but we still have people that want it. So we're, we're trying to work that through our schedule. So how will we incorporate it and how will we plan? Will there be certain days, you know, will we have to put um, restrictions on it, you know, that they have to already be seen as a patient? Can you do a new patient? I mean, you know, because it's not an emergency as it has been. So how are you going to deal with that moving forward? And then we think about, you know, in Illinois just passed a a new telehealth um, guidelines for us and in reimbursement. And so we're real excited about it, but that also opens up the door for people from other states using telemedicine to connect with our hospitals. And, and how will we accommodate that? You know, um, using that word accommodate, how will we adjust to that? Will they have to be a patient established patient? You know, somebody from Texas wants to uh, provide services for hospitals in rural Illinois, how are they going to do it? You know, credentialing and, you know, safety and what if they need local care, but yet they're seeing a physician in Texas, you know, all those things have to be learned. You know, we've been around, we know about it, but it, it now we have to implement. I, I guess one of the positives that came out of all this, if we can try to focus on the positives is that there probably were a lot of lessons learned in terms of how to increase the efficiency of these programs or expand into other areas that maybe they hadn't been doing so before. Right. Um, you know, so that's definitely a positive. Uh, on that note, you know, we talked about telemedicine, but is there anything else just kind of new innovations that you've seen in the past 18 months well, that, that you know, really has- weren't around before? Yeah, um, rural hospitals, particularly that, you know, I work with, they're talking about, you um, how they can support staff better. I think we looked at staff having to be resilient, you know, to get through the crisis. And they did, they mustered up and, you know, people, you know, staff work multiple shifts, you know, extra shifts, you know, a lot of things like that. But the communication support from leaders is how do we keep that, how do we keep them resilient? How do we, you know, some of them are burned out. So how are we going to help them? And and so I think we've really focused on employees and, and it, recognizing them for their work and their positive attitude and, and supporting them and, you know, offering them, you know, recognition, or maybe they need some therapy. You know, some people have had um, post-traumatic um, stress syndrome, you know, from all this, you know, because it was really hard. They saw loved ones die, especially in a small community, you know, everybody <laughs> for sure. the most part, and you're taking care of loved ones and you didn't want them to get COVID, you know, and they got COVID and, and we all wondered about that. And so people internalize things differently, but I think hospital leaders have had to look at that particularly different in our rural communities, because we know our, our employees is how are we going to take care of them? What's, what's going to resonate with them? And, and, um, I said creative, you know, we also have to look at our um, master plans, you know, our building plans. Well, we have to make adjustment in patient care rooms. Well, we have to change efficiencies around because we want to set, we want to segment 
um, outpatients in one area and inpatients in another. I mean, you know, because of infection control practices, you know, are we going to have more screening sites available and, and those kinds of things that you have to look at, um, I think are different. Those are came out of it. Some other programs like um, safe, um, safe hospital programs, you know, where you're showing you're having programs where uh, the public knows that you've got top-notch safety infection control practices, you know, and things like that. There's some things that they want to reassure the public, particularly, like I said, in a small community, you, you want to make sure that your, your small hospital has the best of the best. And so they've participated in a number of uh, of these programs that show that they've done the safety measures, infection control practices, you know, to the upper level. Uh, let's see, some of the other programs, um, I, saw, I think people have learned how to, our clinicians have thought more intently about the care of their patients. Care coordination has really risen to the top of it. What kind of programs do we have in place? You know, getting the patient through the, like a COVID patient through the intense illness and then the recovery, you know, that recovery is different. We've got some hospitals, uh, critical access hospitals looking, well, should they really focus and become a COVID recovery hospital, you know, and, and looking at their rehab services and how can we expand them and to help people through that recovery process. And maybe people come from many other areas. Uh, another area is expanding our behavioral health and dealing with social isolation. We've added more social workers in our primary care practices so that uh, people can, uh, residents coming into the hospitals and our clinics, you know, that they get referred to um, uh, people that can help them with their, their um, mental health issues, their behavioral health issues. We're trying to spot them earlier on and have resources there for them. Not necessarily new, but I think it's risen to the top. We have seen more um, drug um, induced illnesses and because of the social isolation. And so, you know, not only do we have looking at social workers to get that initial review, and, uh, but also therapists that can really work them through those processes. I'm seeing more numbers of medication assisted treatment programs springing up in our rural communities that, you know, more practitioners have taken the course to help people through, you know, substance use disorder. And so those are positive things. I think we've been more intentional about that. The other thing is I think um, hospitals learned, uh, particularly rural hospitals, because you're really caring for the whole community, that rural hospital is the center of care. You don't have three hospitals in, you know, two or three mile radius. You know, you have one hospital taking, you know, a radius of 30, 35 miles. And so you, you're really kind of the center of all that. And so we had to develop really intent working relationships to get through COVID. You know, so we looked at what resources we had, what vaccines were available, you know, all those things we had to have a constant communication. And our hospitals realized the value of that communication. We kind of lost it with electronic records, you know, we got all hung up on electronic records were gonna be our communication tools. But we realized that we needed that one-on-one, -on -one, that day-to-day -day communication. Um, either internally or externally, because we're really taking care of a population. We really understood our population better. You know, when you think about, you know, you're the sole source for this population with your partners, public health, you know, mental health, ambulance, that you're the caretaker, you are kind of locked away from everybody. So how are we going to provide care for? So I think it was really a, a recognition of that responsibility and the value of that partnership and in, in ongoing communication. So, um, and I wish we could Not talk about this for another. But it, it really rose to the top. And I think communication strategies, you know, are the innovation is every, people do it differently. So that, that kind of leads me to the last thing I want to ask you about. And, and this is not, like I was saying, this is not the last thing I want to ask you about. I wish we had more time, but we've got, uh, you know, our next session coming up, our next speaker that we're going to get to. Um, but I, I do want to ask you this. Now, uh, a lot of our audience is going to be leaders within the public sector, community, community leaders, mayors, city managers. Um, you know, you talked about the effectiveness of communication. How can community leaders work to support their hospital networks or even make citizens aware that this kind of stuff exists and that this access to healthcare is out there? What can community leaders do in all this? Well, I think most important is that outreach that they can, these uh, local policymakers can develop 
ongoing communications with hospital leaders and that the messaging has to be similar. You know, um, the mayors can't be saying one thing and the hospital leader is following CDC guidelines and, you know, we've got to really work together. That's really the value and the importance of it. And I think local leaders can work with hospitals and ask them, what are your what are your financial, what are your building needs? How can we support you as you transform and, and look at healthcare differently? How in future pandemics, what do we have to do locally? What are our gaps in care? What are our gaps in resources? Is it food available food? Is it getting um, clinical staff available to help other population? How do we do outreach to um, homebound people? What's our transportation system getting people in and out? You know, the ongoing communication boards. I mean, those are things that I think we have to be all part of each other's planning. We can't be policymakers. We can't be long-term care here. We can't be hospitals here. We can't, you know, we have to, we have to really begin to really work at our population at home. So it's that outreach and developing that long-standing relationship that we're all in this together. And I really hope some of the uh, unity that we've seen in our communities throughout this whole situation, I hope that's something that sticks around as we head into the future. Absolutely, that's really uh, utmost important. And I think, I think the pandemic brought it to light, you know, most explicitly that it's that communication piece and, and being able to share resources if, um, you know, let's say a hospital needed certain medication and treatment, you know, well, somebody from the um, city council or the mayor's office, if hospital staff can't leave, can they send their police or, or staff to another uh, community to get that medication and bringing back? That's working together. And we had parts of that. I know at one time, um, one of the assisted living facilities within that community called the hospital and I said, and they couldn't get all their assisted living patients transferred because they had an outbreak and another facility would take their their um, um, residents and it was like 100 miles away. So how are you getting get all those there? So the hospital working with local leaders were able to get that done. And if you don't talk to people, you can't get that done. Well, I mean, I, I hope they take that lesson to heart and I hope uh, everyone begins talking. Um, if they haven't already, I hope they start now and, and I hope that's something that continues. Well, Pat, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, some fantastic information as always, and I hope that we're able to speak with you again soon. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, man. It was a pleasure once again. And joining me now is Phoebe Seng, the project manager for ICF Taiwan at the Industrial Technology Research Institute. She is a global smart city solutions explorer and currently works at the Smart City Development Project Office delegated by the IDB MOEA in Taiwan, undertaking international liaison and promotional affairs. Phoebe, thank you for joining us. And I feel like I have to ask first, how are things going in Taiwan with the COVID-19 pandemic? It's a pleasure to join you virtually from Taiwan. Hope you're all doing well too. The current status of Taiwan is staying cautious, but positive. In most parts of Taiwan, we have been working from home since mid-May and we're trying to adapt a new norm. Facing the rapid change of the pandemic, Taiwan is strengthening border control and quarantine measures contain um, to contain another outbreak. Everyone is trying their best to adapt. Um, we're very grateful for our international friends, such as the US and Japan for their support. This past year has brought many new healthcare innovations, especially with regards to remote care and telemedicine. What new healthcare innovations have you seen in Taiwan throughout the COVID-19 pandemic? As you may know, Taiwan has been enabling smart city technologies and solutions for many years throughout this journey. The central government, such as Industrial Development Bureau, Ministry of Economic Affairs also devoted policy and projects to support the industry as well as local governments. Both remote care and telemedicine are, are important topics in Taiwan Smart City Solutions. Actually, this, um, these de developments have been taking place long before the outbreak of COVID-19 and they have been proved to be crucial. Recently, I had a chance, um, a chance to speak with a health IT expert from one of the smart city projects in Taiwan. We were talking about some of Taiwan's best practices in smart city, and I learned 
that Taiwan is actually well positioned in developing smart healthcare solutions for the following two reasons. For one, Taiwan started the National Health Insurance Program in 1995, and this has become a driving force for healthcare facilities in Taiwan to gradually transition their paper-based systems to digitalized systems. Secondly, smarter way to collect data became important when building digitalized systems. This is where Taiwan's expertise in IT products made us a suitable contender for many IoT-enabled smart healthcare te technology nowadays. When it comes to innovations, sometimes it's not about using the most advanced technology. Um, it's more about finding smarter ways to do things. And what innovations have you seen that you think might have that potential to stick around as things get back to normal? Telemedicine is definitely becoming a trend, especially under the effect of COVID-19. Prior to COVID-19, telemedicine was mainly needed so patients in remote area can still gain access to um, medical consultation without having to travel on a regular basis. Now with COVID, people are also getting more and more used to this format of communication. Therefore, health IT solution providers in Taiwan, such as LightOn, has developed online consultation platforms to enable Taiwan, Taiwan's hospitals to provide online service to their patients. They do so by integrating online appointments, um, reminders, video conferencing bridge, and so on. Um, and talking about remote, remote patient care is also one thing that will be needed post-pandemic, we believe. For instance, another solution provided from our smart city project, Health Inventor, does so by combining cloud computing, which integrates multiple types of data and their core cognitive engine to perform personalized risk analysis from a human-centered perspective. People using the mobile app can easily get started with self-health management. Are there any Taiwanese companies that have been particularly innovative that you'd like to mention? And I believe you've got something you want to show. Taking ADV Meds is an example. They're innovative in um, a sense that they use technology to help improve the current workflow. Given the outbreak of COVID-19, the standard practice for patients entering the hospitals requires frontline hospital staff to take notes of the contact info, travel or, or occupational history and so on. Say it takes about 30 to 50 seconds per person. At first, um, it was done by pen and paper and it posed as a potential risk for spreading the disease, actually. And taking this into consideration, ADV Med Solutions minimized the first by effectively integrating data on their platform. What, use, um, what used to be done manually by pen and paper now can, um, can now be completed via a web and an app, as well as measurement devices integrated with IoT. As a result, they can shorten the time required significantly. Additionally, I would like to share how the other company from the Smart City Project, Fashion in, um, Intelligence, is doing to fine tune the existing solutions amid COVID 19 pandemic. A little background of their solutions. Originally, they focused on using positioning service incorporated into a wearable device, such as a bracelet or a lucky charm to help prevent elderly from getting lost in their neighborhood. Here, I would like to share a short clip of Kent, General Manager of Fashion and Intelligence, on what they're doing to help the quarantine situation. I want to introduce our reference in overseas for COVID-19 prevention bracelets. So uh, our bracelets can do the whole process of the quarantine. Uh, at first, when the international arrivals, maybe your citizens come back to your nation or the travelers, when they get into the airport and while they uh, be quarantined in their house 
or in certain like uh, hotels. And in the end, when they when their quarantine is dismissed, the whole process we can track and monitoring. And once something unusual happened, our system will notify the control center immediately. So here are the whole roles of this uh, uh, COVID-19 prevention uh, scenarios. First one is uh, airport desk. So when the uh, arrivals come to the desk, they have to do the registration of our system. And the, the registration will be very, very easy, less than three minutes. Uh, start from your arrival, the uh, airport, to the end of the registration, three minutes. And uh, you will submit your name, passport, uh, your photo, and uh, your address, you will stay. And we will make sure the address is the exact address you will go. If you select certain address and you do not go to there, uh, really, the system will check and uh, send the notification to the control center. So how do it do? You scan a bar a QR code in the airport and there is a, a, a page you have to fill in your uh, personal information and uh, the system will immediately use Google to reveal the destination you are going to. So the uh, traveler or arrival have to make sure, yes, I'm going to here. So if you didn't, uh, if you don't go to the exactly destination you assign, the system will trigger alerts. And uh, after you uh, complete the registration, you have to go to your places. During the uh, traveling time, the system can preset like half hour or three hours, depends on the travelers assigned the dest uh, destination. And uh, if you go to the, uh, after you come into your places, the dashboard will manage all of your behaviors for COVID-19 only, for COVID-19 only. So you can see a lot of colors, which shows the unusual behaviors for the quarantine people. So if during the 14 days, you didn't do, you don't do anything unusual, nothing will be triggered. Well, thank you. And thank you for sharing that clip. I'd actually recommend that anyone who's watching this goes and registers to watch the Smart City Virtual Trade Mission to view more information about this and other Taiwanese companies. It can be found on icf-taiwan.com, but that's not the only place that one can go to find out more because I know you've been working on a platform. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Since last year, we have been building and constantly updating the platform www.smartcitytw360.com. Not only can you find Taiwan's uh, healthcare solutions on the website, there are other fields of solutions such as transportation, agriculture, governance, retails, and more. So if you wish to know more about Taiwan solutions or healthcare solutions, please go onto the website. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for joining us. It was great to see you, Phoebe. Thank you very much.